Good morning. My name's Chris Cassis. For those who are new this morning with us, and uh, I'm one of the pastors of uh, Source Church, and it's so good to see all of you here this morning. Had an amazing time at the 80s night last night uh, as we rock and rolled and grooved and uh, just had some fun and fellowship meeting new people and new faces. And as you heard in the announcements today, uh, Mimi's going to be baptized later this afternoon, so we're so excited for that as uh, we'll celebrate at the beach at 4 o'clock if you want to enjoy us or join us and enjoy that. But uh, how many people have enjoyed this series so far? Yeah? Are you liking it? So we started this series, Don't Kill My Vibe, and week one we talked about how life, the Bible says, has the power to bring forth, I should say, words has the power to bring forth life or to bring forth death. Your, your tongue and the things that you actually speak and say and, and produce create life or they create death in an individual. It's why it hurts so bad when somebody who you care about says something mean to you or hurts you or betrays you with words. You know, we have these common phrases, uh, sticks and stones will break our bones, but what? Words will never hurt us? That's, that's not true, is it? It's, it's false. It's a lie. And so words have the power to bring life and power to bring death which a lot of times from those negative experiences was what we concentrated on week number two, is that your greatest enemy is, do you remember? Me, yourself. Yes, your greatest enemy is yourself because we have these words in the back of our head. And these, this tape player plays over and over again. And so when we look in the mirror and we begin to say, oh, you're not as in shape as you are. You don't look like you once did. Or, you know, if you just had looked like this person or... You know, we, we, we beat ourselves up all the time. We're not good enough. We can't do it. And our biggest enemy is ourself. This tape player just destroys us. And so if, if words have the power to bring life, your biggest enemy is yourself. And then last week we talked about what? Your friends influence your life. Right? Your friends, your friends can either influence your life positively or they can influence your life negatively. But your friends influence your life. There is power in influence. And so words have the the power to bring life or death. Our biggest enemy is ourself, and we can encourage ourselves or put ourselves down. And then we have the friends who come into play to either kill our vibe or to give us positive vibes, depending on who we're hanging out with. That's why it's so good to be in church, right, on Sunday morning, where we fellowship and we get along and we handshake and we, we give hugs and, and kisses on the cheek and we just, we're good, it's good to be in church where we have fellowship with God. It's also good to be at fellowship events because you get to know people. It's good to, to join a power group because you get intimate and you get refrigerator rights where you go into somebody's house and you make these awesome friendships over cookies and milk and Dwayne's Tuesday night group does barbecue all the time. I'm so jealous. I'm going to join that group, you know. It's crazy. Oh, no. I'll still teach my group, but I'm going to join that one too because he eats good on Tuesday nights. (laughs) So, today I want to teach about something very important. Not just yourself has the ability to kill your vibe. Not just your friends or the people that you're closest to has the ability to kill your vibe. But there's something else that I think is very, very important that can kill your vibe. And it's culture. Culture has the power to kill your vibe. Because the truth is, as we've been learning in this series, you don't have the power to change your circumstance. But what you do have the power to do is to change your attitude. To change the way you look at life. The way you deal with things. I'm going to read you a story from the Bible. If you open up your Bibles, anybody need a Bible in the house? We have them. We'll pass them out. Just raise your hand. We have them over here. Raise them up in the air and we'll get you a Bible. But I want to open up to Luke 17 and we're going to be reading verses 11 through 19. If you don't know where Luke is, there's an index in the front of your Bibles. But it's also one of the first few books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Luke is the third gospel. And we're going to be going to Luke 17 verses 11 through 19. If you're all there, say amen. Amen. All right. And here's what it says. It says, Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. 
As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. You see, this is so awesome because even in this part, Luke makes the point that he wasn't a Jew, he was a Samaritan. Now Samaritans, if you know anything about culture of the Bible, that Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds. They were half-Jewish and then they were mixed with some other type of person. They had like a Gentile mother, a Gentile father, and so they would often be viewed as a half-breed, a Samaritan. So they weren't really accepted by the Jews. The Jews really did not take them in. There was some racial wars going on at this time, a lot like today. And so he makes the point that the one person who came back to him was a Samaritan. The one person who realized he was downcast. The one person who realized that he had betrayed. Maybe he was a little bit extra in the group where he had just felt like somebody was pressing their thumb on him and oppressing him and he could never get ahead. And so when this miracle happens, he's so grateful and appreciates it. And it names him as a Samaritan. And this is what happens. Jesus asked... We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Like, what happened? Where did these guys go? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? See, even Jesus realizes that he's a foreigner as a Samaritan. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, I just want to point out a couple things in this, this, this passage. Jesus comes to him and says, listen, Where is everyone else? Where is their appreciation for what has happened? You see, these these guys, if if you really need to understand what leprosy is, to understand and appreciate what Jesus had done. Leprosy was a horrible disease. In fact, it was so horrible that it was a a flesh-eating disease, and many times it would kill you and Before you were dead, it would eat away parts of your flesh where the rodents, when these people were sleeping, would come to them and begin to gnaw on their bones. It wasn't a surprise for someone to wake up who had leprosy to be missing a finger or a thumb or a toe because the rodents would actually come and eat their flesh and, and it became numbing to them. And so their body just basically deteriorated and died a very, very painful death. It was so painful Because not only was it a physical pain that they were experiencing of their flesh eating away at them, but it was also a social pain where they were no longer allowed to be in community with anybody else. In fact, the lepers probably were in community amongst themselves because once a person was spotted with leprosy, they would have to go out of the city. They would have to be away from the rest of the people because it was an infectious disease and they didn't want anybody else to get sick. And so if you... Or a family member, a loved one, let's say your mother became leprous. Then she would have to leave your family and you'd never see her again. You'd never be able to touch them again. You'd never be able to touch your child, your mother, your father, your loved one again for the fear that you become leprous and then you would actually have to leave the city as well. So there was strict priestly commandments from Leviticus that says, do not come in contact with a leprous person. Do not touch a leprous person. In fact, if a leprous person became healed, which hardly ever happened, then what would happen is they would have to come and present themselves to the priest, and the priest would have to inspect them, look in their ears, look over their entire body. They would have to strip down in order to be identified that they were clean, and then eight days later they could actually go and join the community again. But that rarely ever happened. And so ten lepers who have leprosy, who are on the brink of death, are identified as Jesus. So it's no wonder when Jesus is walking through, they see him and they say, Jesus, have mercy on us. They have heard Jesus' power and the ability to heal at this point. Jesus had gained some fame. This is right before he's going to go to the cross. And so a few months prior, he had been healing people for over three years now. He had became a famous 
um, person who was out on the sides of the mountains teaching, out on the side of the hills teaching, preaching, and healing. And thousands and thousands of people were coming to him, and the crowds flocked to him. And so Jesus had gained some reputation at this point. And so when the ten lepers hear about him, they cry out, Jesus, heal us, have mercy on us, have pity on us. And Jesus being, and this is where it's so cool, Jesus being God illustrates the relationship of what it is for a person when he cries out to God in pain and suffering and loneliness and hurt. Jesus doesn't say, no, you have leprosy, stay back. Jesus doesn't raise his hand and heal them, you know, from a distance. What does it say that Jesus actually walks over to them? Jesus says, they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. And they went and they cleansed themselves. Jesus became very close to them where he could have a conversation with them, where he could talk to them. Jesus didn't just disown them and walk away and run because they had leprosy. No, Jesus drew close to them. They were crying out in pain and suffering, and Jesus goes right over to them and speaks to them. He's not scared of leprosy. He's not scared of of the ailments that they have. He's not scared of their sickness. He's not scared of their disease. You see, God does not shun you or shy away from you because of the sick things that we've done in our life, the sinful things, the dirty things. God doesn't turn his back on us and flee from us. No, it says that Jesus came into the world for the sick. He came into the world for the broken. He came into the world for those who are hurting. He came into the world for those who need him. Jesus shows up and he heals the leprous people. All of us in some way have some leprous form of a disease called sin. And this sin kills us. This sin penetrates our souls. This sin gets us to do the things, as Paul says, that we shouldn't be doing. And sometimes we don't even want to do, but it entices us. It produces anger within us. It breaks down relationships. It breaks down marriages. It breaks down all of these things that are around us. And we're leper, yet Jesus shows up. And any person who cries out to him and asks for him to heal them, to make them clean, to forgive them, to wash over them. That's exactly what he did when he came into this world. But one person comes back and gives him thanks. The rest just go about on their merry way. How many times do people cry out to God when they're in need? God shows up and does something, miracle in their life, and then they forget all about God. I'll tell you, as we just celebrated 9-11 just recently, you know, I, I think about all the people who came to church during the, the time of the attacks, and then eventually they begin to fall away shortly after. We just forget all about it. I talk in my small group with a bunch of, a group of uh, Haitians who say that during the earthquake over in Haiti, that all they could hear in the middle of the streets in 2008 was Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, they're crying out to him, they need him. And shortly after, as the roads begin to be reconstructed, as the buildings begin to be erected again, people forget about Jesus. They forget about the church, they put him on the back burner because God healed what they needed right then. He healed their physical needs and then they go about on their way. You see, they're missing something. They're missing a gratitude in their life. There's something that this one person has that the other nine doesn't. There's one thing that this one person sees that the other nine are blinded to. And it's this attitude of gratitude. You see, we, we need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude in our lives because culture can often suck gratitude out of our lives by telling us we need something else, we need more, we need better things, and we become this person who looks for, who desires, and who refuses to appreciate what God has given us. You see, we have this, this phrase... That we often say, is the cup half empty or half full? Right? 
We often focus on the half full part with missing that it's half empty or people focus on that it's half empty with missing that it's half full. And the gratitude, because we want this to be all the way full, begins to get zapped out of us. This last week I was um, going to one of our uh, pastor's meetings and, and we met and, and uh, one of the things I love to start out with with all of these meetings along with uh, what I do with our core team and any meeting that I'm at, I, I always ask people, let's celebrate the win. Can we, think of, can we think of one win that you've had in each of your ministry? And we went around and sometimes it's very difficult for people to think of the wins because they can't realize what's going on, what they've been given, what they've been awarded, what God has already done in their life. They can't see God in a sense. They're blinded. All they see is the problems. All they see is the circumstances. In fact, for me, I was going over there and I was thinking, what win have we really had in the last couple weeks, you know? And I was thinking about that. And I don't know about you, but you ever get on social media and you begin to compare your life with other people's lives? Well, sometimes in the pastor's world, we compare our ministry with other people's ministries and so you'll jump on Facebook and you'll start looking at some other churches and how they're growing and all the people there and some of the things they're doing and you're just like oh I wish I could be that cool I wish I could have those lights I wish I could have that stage I wish I could have that sound system I wish I could have those speakers right and we begin to compare and I was just getting this downward discouragement as we went in there and then I started to think it's almost like God spoke to me right there he said, are you kidding me? You have a baptism coming up on Sunday. You have somebody who has given their life to Christ in the last two years as you've walked beside them and you're going to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus in that. And it just shocked me right there. It just hit me right in the spot. And, and Mimi's baptism was the thing that I celebrated. I celebrated it with those pastors. I celebrated it with our core team because a baptism is something to celebrate. But sometimes we can lose the gratitude of what God has done because we're so focused on what we want him to do. And so the first thing that I want to talk to you about, and I got a couple quotes for you. William Arthur says this. He says, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Isn't that good? Feeling, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Where are the other nine? Where have they gone? I've given them a gift. Why aren't they coming back and giving me a gift of thankfulness? Why aren't they saying thankful to me? Have you ever spent the time preparing a gift for somebody, for spending time and effort and thought and preparing a gift or purchasing a gift or doing something for somebody and they don't even have the ability to say thank you? I am horrible at this, by the way. I am great at saying thank you to everybody else. If you get me a gift, I will praise you and say thank you, by the way. But I'm horrible when it comes to the people that are right around me, my immediate family, including my wife. For years, I didn't understand the, the ability that my wife had where she would go out and get me a present. You know what I immediately thought? The payment and the credit card that I was going to have to make for that present. And so what I would do is she would go out and she would get me an expensive pair of shoes. Instead of being so grateful for that pair of shoes, I would say, why don't you just take it back and I'll get the $10 pair over here, you know? I always wanted to return her presents. Until one day she came to me and she said, Chris, every single time you want to return my gifts, it's like you're saying you don't appreciate it. You, it hurts when you do this. And I didn't even realize. I was just thinking, I don't need an $80 pair of shoes. I don't need a $300 gift. I don't need this. No, just take it back. We'll save the money. I'll use it on you. And she's like, you're not understanding. I put some thought into this. I thought you needed it. I thought you wanted it. And you don't even appreciate it. It robs us of the appreciation. Francis Schaeffer says the beginning of man's rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. You see this, this attitude of gratitude. And so point number one that I want to teach you this morning, how to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Point number one is I want you to really see and understand that we need to appreciate the cup that's half full. We need to appreciate the cup that's half full. Ways to do this is go home and just think of one positive thing that God has done for you today. 
You know, some people even start a, a journal on this. They can create a list of five different things. So if you're feeling like, you know, God's just not blessing you, you're not measuring up, that your vibe is just down, you're a negative place, you're in a negative world, and maybe it's because you're comparing to other people or seeing other things, but you're just not feeling it. You want the feelings to flow, you need to start thinking the thoughts. Feelings follow the thoughts. Feelings, the heart, follows the thoughts in the brain. And so as you can create thoughts and you can write them down and journal them down, I encourage you, write down five things that God's done for you every single day. Five things that he's blessing with you with. And you're like, I can't see that. Well, you know what? Do you have life today? Do you have clothing today? Do you have a pair of shoes today? Are you sitting in an air-conditioned theater? Yeah, I'm sweating out here, but you know, you guys are in recliners back there. You know, this is great. I mean, there is people who are praising and worshiping God have in over 100 degree heat in little huts, and that's all they have. They don't have speakers. They don't have sound systems, and they have to walk for miles to get there. You see, often we don't see God because we're not focused on the half full of the cup. If you have another day of life, It's a blessing. If the cup is half full, we need to praise God for the cup for the half full part of the cup, right? We could it could be all the way empty. Instead of focusing on the space, we need to focus on that it's actually half full. We need to name and appreciate the things that God has done for us and the things that He's given us. You see, when we don't appreciate it often, we'll focus on the wrong part of the cup. Why is it that we don't really appreciate something until we don't have it anymore? I mean, think about it. Why is it that we wait until we lose it before we actually appreciate it? Now, I'm I'm speaking very seriously to some of you this morning. Because some of you have kids, and you only have your kids in your house for about 18 years. I know some of you might have them at 19, 20, 21 still in your house, you know. But eventually they will move out, I guarantee it. Even at 40, they might still move out. But some of you have kids, and you only really have the ability to affect your kids for the first 18 years of their life. Because when they become an adult, they're finally going to say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm going to move, I'm going to make my own choice, I'm going to make my own decisions, I'm an adult, I'm going to do my own thing. Right? And so... Why is it that we wait to spend time with our kids until after they leave? Why is it that we focus on the things that we need and desire instead of the things that are right in front of us important to us? Some of us for our marriages, why is it that, or our relationships even, for for people who are dating, why is it that we wait until we lose that person before we actually want them back and begin to appreciate that person? See, I would believe that we would have more Christian relationships that are surviving, more marriages surviving, if we appreciate the person that's right before us when God gives them to us. Can we appreciate the things that they've done for us, the things, the qualities that they have, the positive things, and can we boost them up? Why is that we wait until we no longer have it before we miss it? I have a a piece of a, a door here. And you know what this represents? It represents my children who would get upset at me and they would go and they would slam the door. And I kept warning them and telling them, listen, if you keep slamming my doors, they would get mad, they would walk away. I know it's funny. They would walk away and they'd go to the room and they'd slam the door. They'd be like, it's my bedroom door, I can slam it. I said, no, I own that bedroom door. I own this bedroom. I pay the mortgage. I pay for the house. And so this is my door. And I said, if you keep slamming the door, I'm going to remove the doorknob. If you keep locking the door, I'm going to take the lock right off it. And I kept warning them and warning them until one day it's just gone. They woke up out of their beds, they came, and they're like, Dad actually did it. He removed our door. Yeah, it's been like four months now and they still can't lock their door. They can't even slam it because it doesn't slam shut anymore. You know, it doesn't go into the latch. And I removed it and now they're actually coming to me and saying, Dad, can I please have my door back? Why is it that we wait? I warned you plenty of times. I asked you not to do it. I told you not to do it. I was right in your face pleading with you not to do it. And you do it over and over again. And now when it's missing, now you're going to tell me you're going to obey? Now you're going to tell me you're going to actually do what I ask you to do? It's the same thing that God says. I'm all around you all the time. I'm blessing you all the time. When are you going to realize it? When are you going to praise me? When are you going to clap and say, yes, Jesus, thank you. Thank him for the praises that we have. 
Appreciate a half full cup. Appreciate that it's half full. I got some pictures for you this morning just to show you. I went to Mexico a number of years ago on a youth mission trip. And I just want to show you that some of the, the houses that we saw, some of these are, are mixed with uh, Mimi's ha Haiti trip as well. So there's some houses that she has from Haiti. There's some houses that I saw from, from Mexico. And these are how people are living. They're, I saw one that, person who was living in a school bus. I saw people who were lis, living in, in pallets. I saw people who were just find anything. They had no running water. They had no electricity. They had to carry everything in. And these are people's everyday life. They live on less than $2 a day. They have to walk miles to get anything that they need. We have cars that we drive. We have grocery stores right around the corner from our house. We sit in air conditioning. There's so many things when we begin to look around that we can see that we have a cup that's at least half full. And we get to appreciate it. You want to really cultivate an attitude of appreciation? Begin to realize what God has actually blessed you with. I love the movie The End of the Spear because at the very end, if you've ever seen it, it's a, it's a movie on a missionary couple who go to, um, down to South America and they're trying to befriend some Indians, some Native Americans of that country. And, and what happened is these people are killing everybody. And, and one of them actually ends up losing his father. One of the missionary sons ends up losing his father. And the son befriends the chief of this tribe. And years later, it shows a clip at the end of the movie. And he comes to America for his very first time. He's probably old in his 80s at this point. And he's over at America for the first time. And, and he goes, what's that building next to your houses? These things are huge. You guys live in mansions. He goes, oh, that's the garage. And he goes, what's a garage? He goes, oh, that's like a house for our cars. And he says, you guys are so rich, you even have houses for your cars. Think about it. They're living whole families in these little bitty places. Now, I don't say this to make you feel guilty for what you have, but I do say it because we need to realize that we do have something. And if we have something, that's what God has blessed us with. It says all good gifts come from him above. The second thing is that we need to stop focusing on the empty space. We need to stop focusing on what we want. We need to stop focusing on why this is half empty. You see, Exodus 20, I think there's a reason that God says, do not covet. Exodus 20 says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You see, what God is saying, he gives us this 10th commandment and he says, don't covet. Don't desire what other people want or have. Don't desire what other people have and want it for yourself. Because if you're so focused on what they have, you might miss what he's trying to give you and do in your life. He says, listen, do not desire everything that that other person has. Desire what he's doing for you right now. And he says, don't, don't go out and coveting. I, I used to do this all the time. I used to look at my, my neighbor's lawn and I would be so jealous I mean, they had true green coming to their house and they had all the great fertilizers and, you know, I couldn't really afford true green. And, and so I would be out there just putting fertilizer after fertilizer and cutting my grass and trying to trim all the bushes and just competing. I was competing. I was a competitive person. And so I'd look at my grass and theirs and I wanted mine just to be as green. And I would get so mad. And what happens is it robs us from the joy of what God's doing because I would be so mad that I didn't have what that other person had that I would not even focus that I had grass at all, right? I wasn't living on a dirt hill. I had some grass in my yard. We get robbed of what the things that we have now. I want to take you to a story in Exodus. In Exodus, it says this, or sorry, Numbers 11. Numbers 11. I want to take you to Numbers 11. And the Israelites are, are in the desert. They're in their wilderness. And if you remember the story that, from Numbers that as they're traveling in the desert for 40 years, God supplied them with food. Everything they needed was from God. He supplied them with water. He supplied them with food. And it was almost like a, a miraculous giving. When manna would show up on the ground and manna was like this sweet crust-like substance like bread and they would have to go out and they would collect it. And they would do this every single day. They would go out and collect manna. 
And on the seventh day that they rested, they had to collect for two days on the sixth day. And if they stored any of it and saved any of it, often it would be produced with maggots because God wanted them to rest on the seventh day. It's what he commanded them to do. Even though they weren't obedient, some of them found out that there was maggots that showed up because they didn't listen. And so they're collecting manna after manna, day after day, year after year for 40 years. And in Numbers 11, it says, the rabble within them, the negative spirit, the social culture that kills our vibes, the rabble within them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite and we see anything but this manna. You see, they're complaining because they remember how it was. But they're forgetting all the trials they had in Egypt. They're forgetting the persecution. They're forgetting that Pharaoh used to take their newborn babies and throw him, them in the Nile River and kill them. They're forgetting the tragedies that happened. And they're saying, if only we could go back to Egypt where we had the foods that we wanted, where we had the buffet lines, where we had the choice meats. Not realizing the blessing that God's giving them right then. You see, when we focus on the empty space, we miss that the cup is half full because we're focused on the empty part. We miss that God has been giving them manna all along, that he's been blessing them, he's been providing for their needs. They have something to eat, but because they don't have their choice foods, they begin to complain. They forget about all the other things, and that's what grumbling does. When we begin to compare to everybody else, when we compare to the person next to us, when we desire what they have, and we want what they have. We forget what God has blessed us with today. It kills our vibe. Social media can kill our vibe if we use it to compare our lives to everyone else. Because the truth is, on social media, everyone's posting their highlights of their life. Correct? They're trying to get the best selfies. They're trying to get the best pictures. They're trying to look and, and let, let me stand this way so I'm a little bit thinner. Let me flex this muscle so this bulges. And we want everyone to see what we have. But nobody's posting those times when they're feeling down. When they just wake up in the morning and they haven't put makeup on. Right? You don't see those pictures often. You don't see what it's like at, at 2 in the morning when you're getting up with a crying baby, do you? You don't see what it's like when your kids are yelling at you and screaming at you and, and slamming doors. No, we don't, we don't post these things. And so we compare our lives to other people and the things that they have and we desire those things and we miss the blessing that God has given us today. To cultivate an attitude of gratitude, we really need to focus on what God has already given us. The last thing I want to show you, going back to this passage, is that the one that came back, the one leper person that came back says when Jesus saw them in verse 14, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now realize that there had to be an act of faith here. There had to be something that happened. Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest. He doesn't just say you're clean. He doesn't just say here, you're healed. No, he says, go show yourselves to the priest. And so they actually had to be obedient to what God was telling them to do. And so as they began to walk in faith that they were going to be healed, along the way, they actually became healed. You see, there's an act of faith in it. And so as they were healed, one person realizes that he's healed. And on his way, he turns back around and he goes back to Jesus and he falls down at Jesus and he says, thank you. And Jesus says, where are the other nine? He says, go, your faith has healed you. What it actually means there is this word in the Greek where he says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. What he's saying is, your faith has saved you. Not just well physically, well spiritually, well emotionally. This word actually means in a way whole. Your faith has made you whole. You found who I was. The other nine got healed physically, but they're still broken spiritually. There's a, a Marlin player that people were telling me that just woke up this morning and, and found out that he had been, he, he died. He died in a boating accident, right? Jose Fernandez, one of the best players of the Marlins, I was told. Baseball player, 24 years old, dies in a boating accident. I said, is he a believer? 
People don't think so. His wife's pregnant. You see, often we think that we can wait till tomorrow to accept forgiveness. Tomorrow we think we can wait to receive what God has offered us. Tomorrow we think we can wait to go and appreciate what God has given us. Tomorrow we think we can wait in order to receive salvation. But what this says is where's the other nine? You see, the other nine were so focused on getting to the priests so they could get back to their family. The other nine were so focused on getting back to their children or their loved ones. The other nine were so focused on getting back to their jobs that they forgot to give credit to the one who had healed them. They were healed physically, but they weren't healed spiritually. There was only one who realized that the physical equals the spiritual. And he turned back around and he fell at Jesus' feet and Jesus says, your faith has healed you and saved you. There's people in here this morning that we need to give credit to God because he saved us. There's people who we need to realize that yes the cup might only be half full in our circumstance but at least we have half of this cup. And what he tells us over and over again is, and I love water by the way, I always do these water illustrations because I just love water. It's like baptism. You can imagine my playtime at my house with bath time with my kids. I just love it. All right. I want to show you this because I think it's so important. That God tells us over and over again, even the parts that we have that are half full physically, what does he say? He tells us to give them away. That's what he says. He says, whatever you have, give away. That's why we do offerings. That's why we do tithings. That's why we come together as a body and we give back to God. It's not to, just to get money and, and to do a financial campaign and, and to get from church so Pastor Chris can buy more things. You know, that's not, the, that's not the reason. God teaches us over and over again what we have is God's and to give it away. Why does he teach that? Because there's a principle where we think that this is mine. There's a principle where we think we want more. There's a principle where we get so focused on what we have what we want that we don't even focus on what we have anymore and we don't appreciate it. As soon as the new iPhone comes out, what do we do? We, we hate the old one. We throw it in the trash. And we go buy the new one, right? We need to have the new things, the new, the, everything that's new. We don't even appreciate it. God says, give it away. Why does he teach us to give it away? Because over and over again, when he says, pour out what you have, guess what? You're making yourself empty in order for him to pour into you. You're using what you have and you're pouring it out into God's kingdom. And do you know what God does? He, it's not like, oh, now I have an empty cup. What am I going to do? Now I can't eat. Now I can't survive. No, you still have a cup. You still have something. You see, we get so focused on how empty this is that we don't realize that we still have a cup. If you are a living, breathing entity, a body this morning, then you have made yourself available. Then you have a purpose for the Holy Spirit to use you. You have a body for the Holy Spirit to fill. And so as long as you have a body that's awake this morning, that's breathing, that has life in it, then you have a cup. And the Holy Spirit can come into your life and he can fill up that life. And so as long as you have a cup, as long as you have a body, as long as you have a soul, as long as you are alive this morning, then God can come into your life and he can fill your cup. He has an unlimited amount of water that he can pour in. And he is waiting for us to empty ourselves by giving out the things that we have, by emptying the things that we feel that we need in order to fill into us. It's not bad to want things, but sometimes we can want the wrong things. I want to be a good father. I want that. I want to be a better husband. I want that. I want to be a better leader. I want that. I want to be a better pastor. I want that. And so I'll read books and listen to things. But if I shortchange the things that are important, like being a better father or husband, for working countless hours in order just to get the cars, to get the bigger houses, to get the better paycheck. I can surpass everything that God has given me right now because I'm so focused on getting this cup full myself that I miss the spiritual. I get selfish. I hold it in myself. I'm no longer giving it out to people in need. I'm holding it in and taking it in because I'm trying to get ahead of everyone else. I become very selfish and it affects my heart. And what God wants us to do, he wants us to pour out the things that we have and give it away in order to pull back into us. I'll give you a great analogy just to finish out. That Jesus tells us 
In John 3.16, the purpose that he came to this world. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Realize that. He gave him away. His child, his loved one, the only one that was perfect. He gave him to people. For what? That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus poured himself out, making himself available to all of us. Jesus says, you know what? I don't want to die. I don't deserve to die, but I'm going to die because it's the only way for my people to come to you. And so he goes to the cross, and he hangs on the cross, living a perfect life. Not just to forgive us, but to hang in our place. Because, you know, people ask all the time, why is it that bad things happen to me? But we don't ask, why is it when good things happen to us? Do we? We always ask God, why is it that you're allowing this to happen to me? But we never praise him and say, why is it that you're allowing these good things to happen to me? No, we just accept it. But the truth is, all of us deserve hell. Because all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen away from God. The Bible says that we fall short. None of us deserve salvation. But Jesus hung on the cross in order for us to receive it. He hung in our place. He went to the cross for us. So he hangs instead of us. And he poured out himself and for all to be saved. And then three days later, God raises him from the dead. And he walks with a new body. And he walks with a new life. And he's raised up to heaven. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he says, whoever believes in me, God gave his son away. And he raises him from the dead. He pours life back into him. And he says, whoever believes in me shall also be saved. Amen, right? That's a glorious story. We should celebrate. And so there's always something to celebrate. Are you a believer this morning? Then you have salvation, eternal security with God the Father. That's something to celebrate. Do you have a relationship with God? If you're a believer, you should. That's someone to always walk with you no matter what you're going through in life. That's something to celebrate. Do you have a communication with God? We do that through prayer. You have someone that you can always talk to so you're not alone by yourself. If you feel lonely and isolated this morning, your father is always there ready to hear you as you cry out to him. Just as the leper said, Jesus have mercy on us and Jesus shows compassion. You see, in our relationship with God, we have so many blessings. Everything else might be going wrong in our life, but we are still half full. We still have a cup. We still have to make ourselves available for Jesus to pour himself into us. And as the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us, when we become a believer, he fills us. He fills our cup. It's not just what we want, but it's what we need. And when we chase after what we need, we get what we want. But if we chase after what we want, we don't always get what we need as we saw from the story. So what are you chasing after this morning? Are you chasing after all the physical things of this earth? All the things to get ahead? They're not bad things. But if you want what you really need, which is Jesus, which is a relationship with, with the Father, which is something to eternally celebrate, we're not called to put it off for tomorrow. We're called to go and thank Him for our salvation today. And if you need salvation because you don't have a relationship with Jesus, He's here this morning wanting a relationship with you. He gave us his son in order to substitute him in our place. And all we do is have to be thankful for it. And that's why we serve. That's why we do what we do because we're thankful. That's why people come early in the morning and they set up this church for you to come and sit in because they're thankful that you're here and they're thankful what the Holy Spirit's going to do on your life and they're thankful for those who are going to be saved and they're thankful for baptisms like me. We're thankful for it. Are you thankful for what God has done for you? That he gave you his son? So this morning, if you need to receive Jesus, because maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe the Holy Spirit's just poking at you as I'm preaching this, because you're not a very grateful person. Maybe you're feeling just this misery, and you love to compare yourself with other people. You don't even try to do it, but you do it. You do it all the time. You're always looking at the, cat, the cup half empty instead of half full. And you need to receive Jesus this morning as we play this final song and we go into this final song. If you need a relationship with Jesus this morning, we want to pray for you. We want to pray over you. I'm just going to ask you to come down here to these first, this first row where we can just pray over you. And you know, you're scared. The lights are off. People can't see you. We just want to celebrate with you. 
If everyone has a relationship in here with Jesus, that's great. Blessings. Focus on the things that he's given to you every single day. But if you want what Jesus has offered, what the Father has offered by giving his son on the cross for you, I invite you to come forward to receive that relationship for the very first time. Remember, it's an act of obedience. As they were walking, they were healed. There's something that we got to do. We have to be obedient. We have to make ourselves open. We have to make ourselves vulnerable. We have to empty ourselves of this cup. So if the things like pride are getting in your way, the things of insecurity are getting in your way, the things that these voices are coming back to your head, remember, you're your biggest enemy. Get rid of those voices and come forward to the altar this morning because God gave his son for you. He commands us to give our life to him. And those who give their life, they'll find what they need and they will discover what they want because we don't always know what they want. We don't always know what we want. We always think we want something, but we have sin in us, and God wants to remove that sin from us by dying in our place. And so if you need to receive that salvation, the thing that you need this morning, don't wait. Come forward to the altar as we sing this song. Will you please rise?